there are a number of ironies, we might call it, and uh, interesting things to be discovered from the story that Matthew gives us at the beginning of his gospel. A gospel which, by the way, is primarily directed in its writing to Jewish Christians in the early church, and yet begins with this beautiful truth that peppers the whole of the gospel, the whole of the New Testament, that Jesus is to be worshipped and adored as the Messiah, not simply for the house of Israel, but for the whole world. And so they come, these mysterious wise men, as they are called, Magi, probably from Arabia, and make their long journey and are welcomed. As indeed in Luke's Gospel, by surprise, it is shepherds, people on the margins, the poor, people who were unacceptable because they are unable to keep the law because of their job, who were the first ones to be drawn in, to be invited. And now we have these wise men, who are invited not because they are wise or rich, but just because they are people. made in the image of God, whose image needs to be restored, as it will be through the saving work of the one who is in the crib. And isn't it ironic that they find their way to the right place, having gone first of all to Jerusalem, they are directed to the right place by the one who will seek to destroy the child, by Herod who summons his own wise men, who know that the Messiah is to come from Bethlehem. And not for the first time, but perhaps for the first time, and not the only time, Herod begins the long line of enemies of the Kingdom of God, who end up serving that Kingdom. This is a deep mystery. And notice in the text that Jesus is described as one who is born king. Not born to be king, but born king. That is to remind us that his kingship can never be removed from him. It may be unacknowledged, it may be forgotten about, it may be parodied, it may be pilloried, it may be rejected, but it cannot be taken away because it is his, because he is who he is. He's like no other king. And the world may have its errors, and there have been plenty of them, and still are. For he was a tyrannical leader who murdered his own family. And when it says Jerusalem was in turmoil because of the child, as it later will in the story, the whole city was in turmoil because they did what the king did, because they were under his rule and fear. For no matter how many Herods there are, or may come. There is a king. There is a king to follow, who is of a different order, though he has our humanity, but he is of the divine order. And so well may the wise men from Arabia kneel and adore, born king. shepherds and the wise men worship him. They persevere in their journey. A hard time they had of it. In that extraordinary and wonderful poem by T.S. Eliot with which we began this Mass, which surely Eliot, that church warden from an Anglican church in London and great poet and playwright and social commentator to remind the Christian that the very life we live is in a sense like the journey of the wise men and we must persevere. The difference being that we are accompanied on the way 
by the very one we shall in the end and in our beginning greet and see, truly see. They persevere and they worship and they are changed. Did you notice at the end, and probably if you know the story well, they went home another way. They were changed. In the poem of T.S. Eliot, they are changed in heart. It's not simply a question of finding another route home. And when a person has an encounter with Jesus, that is the case. It just is the case. They are changed. And not left the same. Even if it's leaving them with an it this ease that they have turned their back on him. But if they welcome him, they are indeed changed. The terror will of course continue for the Holy Family. One might imagine that in God's plan he would find his way into our world, into our life, at a more peaceful time, when things were easier. But it is not his way. And neither can a Christian expect it. Lord, why didn't, you, why didn't you bring me forth from my mother's womb in the great ages of faith, in the ages of Christendom, in the ages when actually there weren't people poo-pooing or undermining the Christian faith? Or why didn't you bring me forth into the world in the days when people bowed to bishops? Ah, how marvelous that would be. At the appointed time, he sent his son into a hostile world. And if he sends some Christians into hostile worlds, and ours is not hostile, we're just battered with popcorn, frankly, compared to many other places. Nevertheless, the expectation that the Christian life is easy is foolish. And though it brings great consolations, it also brings great challenge and requires great courage. The poem of T.S. Eliot, which is in your service paper and is worth taking home and reflecting on, speaks of the challenge on the journey, not simply of the hardness of the road and the length of it, but the wondering if it was all folly. The voices crying in their ears, why are you bothering? the temptations of the world, it's all there. But they keep on. It is their resolve to find the key. This, of course, is a time of great resolve-making by folk. It's sort of traditional to make resolutions as a year ends and a new one begins. Michael Ramsey, who was um, one time Archbishop of Canterbury and a, and a godly man, he proved that it's, it's actually very effective to try and be a godly person as a leader. He generally wore his cassock everywhere, and when he was asked, why do you wear your cassock, which wasn't really very fashionable even in the church, he said, well, if I wear a suit, people think I'm a bureaucrat. <laughs> he wore his cassock. He found that people spoke to him differently some reason. Anyway, when he was talking to a group of clergy about, about um, new beginnings and helps for a new year of grace, as we begin a new year of grace here at Christ Church in our lives, he gave the clergy some helps. And I want to share them with you. They're his, they're not mine. And although they were for clergy, they fit any Christian, it seems to me. So here's some helps for this new year, whether you want them or not. And there are copies of this 
at the back of the church you want to take one away with you. First of all, thank God often and always, carefully and wonderingly, Michael Ramsey says. Thank God. Thankfulness, he says, is the soil in which pride does not easily grow. Thankful for small things and great things, but an attitude of heart so that thanksgiving be our perpetual attitude of life. For this child. And when we lose a thankful heart, when I lose a thankful heart, it is because I am losing sight of Jesus. That's the truth. Thank God often and always. And then Michael Ramsey, it seems, so they say, rather hesitantly, knowing his own self, says, take care about the confession of your sins. For he says, as time passes, the habit of being critical about people and things grows more than each of us realize. How the critical spirit can invade our lives. It's going to be happening, if you've got the capacity to raise one eyebrow, which I have, by the way, it's a very dangerous thing. It's generally born of a well-put critique. Graciously put, of course. Nevertheless, resolve, he says, to stop being critical about people and things when that critique is unnecessary. Let this be a resolution in my heart and yours. Thirdly, he says, be ready to accept humiliations. That balks a bit until I remember that the word humiliation comes from the same word as humble. Human, earthly. If Jesus accepted humiliation and was humble, how dare I not accept those humiliations when they come my way? They can hurt terribly, he says. Some are trivial and some are big. Accept the humiliations. And when, when I fall against humiliations that come my way, it is because I have taken my eyes off Jesus, off Jesus. That's why it's probably good that people don't bow too much to bishops these days. That once or twice would be nice. <laughs> I won't get carried away. Accept humiliations. Fourthly, he says, in practices particularly directed at leaders, do not worry about status. There is only one status, he says, that our Lord bids us to be concerned with. And that's our proximity to Him. Resolve to stay close to Jesus, and you won't worry about your status. For you'll be on your knees, if not physically, in your heart in your heart. And finally, Michael Ramsey says, use the sense of humor God has given you. Laugh. Laugh at things. Laugh at the absurdities of life. Laugh at yourself. Another Archbishop I met once, Desmond Tutu, who carried the weight of so much on his shoulders and lived with the apartheid regime for much of his life. Yet, his laugh echoed around the church and South Africa. 
not because he was a trivial person, but because in the midst of it all, there was a deep joy. A deep joy. And he could laugh at himself. If you can't laugh at yourself, best not to laugh at others, if I must say. Marco Ramsey finishes this little bit of advice and says, if you live this way, through the coming year, people will thank God for you. And let the reason for their thankfulness be not just that you were a person they liked or loved, but because you made God real to them. My brothers and sisters, if in the next year you can, by grace, make God real to one person, there would be more joy in heaven. That would be resolution enough. But like the wise men, you'll have to give yourself to perseverance and to worship and to allow yourself to be changed. people catch the traces of Christ in you in the year ahead.